of trees is stealing down, and the evening hush is falling o'er the college and the town. Come and gather on the campus, make the gray old maples ring with the songs of Alma Mater, with the songs we love to sing for the dear old college homeboys, for the happy, happy days, for our glorious Alma Mater. Shake the campus with her praise. Brothers, while the shadows deepen, while we stand here heart to heart, let us promise one another in the silence ere we part. We will make our life successful we will keep our hands from shame. For the sake of dear old Dartmouth and the honor of her name, for the dear old college homeboys, for the happy, happy days, for our glorious alma mater, shake the campus with her praise. Thank you, guys. We are indeed the Dartmouth Heirs, and we're going to continue to sing for you guys as people trickle in. That was the Twilight song. Um, and coming up next, we have Dartmouth Undying. It's pretty special to our group and hopefully to all of you as well. How can we be silent and remember the splendor and the fullness of her days? Who can forget her soft September sunsets? Who can forget those hours that pass like dreams? The long, cool shadows floating on the campus, the drifting beauty where the twilight streams. Who can forget her sharp and misty mornings, the clanging bells, the crunch of feet on snow? Her sparkling noons, the crowding into commons. The long white afternoons, the twilight glow. See, by the light of many thousand sunsets, Dartmouth undying, like a vision starts. Dartmouth, the gleaming, dreaming walls of Dartmouth, miraculously builded in our hearts.
Thank you all so much. Uh, this is now the part of the show where we like to introduce ourselves. Takes a second. Mm. You're on the last one. A one, a two, a skiddly diddly do. What song is this? Down, 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 be doo be down, 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 down. Down be do be down, 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 down be do be down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Down, 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 down be do be down, 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 down be do be down, 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 down be do be down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, down, darling, down, come and go, we do be down, 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 way beyond me. I Thank you guys. Uh, for the last song, we're going to sing the alma mater. Please join. Yeah. 
wins in their bread. And the granite of New Hampshire is made part of them till death. And the granite of New Hampshire is made part of them till death. Good morning. I am a uh, proud daughter of Dartmouth, a member of the Hopkins Center Advisory Board, and chair of the Dartmouth Board of Trustees. And my name is Laurel Ritchie. Thank you. It is, it is my pleasure uh, to be asked to introduce this morning's session in this program. Uh, and before we begin, uh, I have a couple of shout outs. Uh, first, I'd like to offer a shout out to uh, my fellow trustees here with us this morning, Mitch Kurz, class of 1973. <laughs> Ellie Laughlin, class of 1989. <laughs> Caroline Kerr, class of 2005. And the newest member, or one of the newest members of the Board of Trustees from the great class of 1989, Connie Britton, who's like less than a week on the job. So welcome, Connie. <laughs> My second shout out is to all of the volunteers who had a hand in planning this year's reunions. Um, I just want you to know that we understand and truly, truly appreciate all the hard work that goes into planning reunions. And if you think of Hanover as I do, as our base camp to the world, there's something quite fitting about the fact that less than a week ago, we launched the, two th the class of 2019 out into the world. And today, we are welcoming the classes of 1973, 1974, and 1975, 1989, uh, 1984, 2003, 2004, and 2014, back to campus. <laughs> Similar to last weekend, the campus is abuzz with energy and activity, although I can only speak for myself and say it takes me slightly longer to make the trip across the green and I suspect that those who were ordering the fleeces with the logos probably had to have a slightly broader range of sizes available to their constituents. You guys are a very lucky group because not only are we celebrating your reunion milestone, you probably haven't heard it yet, but we're celebrating Dartmouth's 250th anniversary. So this gathering today uh, is part of a slate of year-long activities designed to honor our past and to inspire our future. Dartmouth alums have re-argued the very famous Daniel Webster case in the Supreme Court, the chambers of the Supreme Court, and right upstairs in Alumni Hall. You'll be very happy to know that in both cases, Dartmouth won. <laughs> Phil and I have been on a 12-city and counting uh, road tour, taking Dartmouth on the road, meeting with alumni across the country and soon across the world, sharing his ambitious uh, plans for our future. Our faculty, under the leadership of Don Pease and in concert with Cheryl Bascom, have put together an incredible array of classes for our students in this anniversary year. Classes like, Is Dartmouth a Religion? Which I've really asked Don to take on the road because I think we all want the answer to that question. Uh, the Collective Memory of Slavery at Dartmouth. And there's a literature class where every author on the syllabus is a Dartmouth alum. And in the second half of the year, uh, the hits just keep, keep on coming. I hope you've seen the architectural dig on the green. 
There is a fall premiere of a work commissioned for the Dartmouth uh, Wind Ensemble that is composed by Oliver Kaplan, class of 2004. And on November 4th, Dartmouth will face Princeton in New York City at Yankee Stadium. It's a big stadium, lots of seats to fill, so come and bring everybody you know with you. We'd love to have you. Another component of our 250th celebration is the call to serve. This is our commitment as a community to donate or to contribute 250,000 hours of community service. This is a global initiative, uh, and as of this week, I believe we have hit the halfway mark of 125,000 hours. So, yeah. We invite all of you to participate in the call to serve. There's some opportunities to do so this afternoon on campus and also when you return home. Um, either way, we hope you'll join us and I don't know about you, but I think there's something really lovely about the fact that as we celebrate our future uh, and the strength of our Dartmouth community, we are thinking about others and making a difference in the world through our service. So I do hope you'll join us, and I have no doubt that we're going to not just reach but exceed that 250,000 hours. So that brings me to today's program. Uh, the March of Time video that opened the program, I think, was a perfect setup for this session. Change is organic and part of Dartmouth's long and storied history. And as you well know and experience probably in your daily lives, the idea of disruption is ever present. It comes from all directions, all sources, and we as an institution have learned to respond, to pivot, and to change. But we've also learned to lead that disruption. And uh, if you think about whether it's basic, the computer language that was started here under John Kemeny's leadership, or our standard setting foreign study program, we have been change agents and we will continue to be change agents. And in a world that's getting more complex every day where the rate of change is faster and faster and new industries are created, not in decades, but in a couple of years, um, we need to be ready for this. And I have great faith that we are ready for this because I know all the members of our next panel. Uh, they are accomplished in their own right and in their individual fields of study. They are curious about the future and about the unknown. They are compassionate towards each other, the students in their care, and the citizens of the world. I have had the pleasure of hearing from them on many occasions, and I will admit one of my fantasies as board chair is to reach out to my other Board, fellow board chairs at other institutions and say, you bring your deans, I'll bring my deans, and I know that I would kick ass, so. Um, <laughs> we'll just keep that little challenge amongst ourselves, but I do really think it would be terrific. Um, I am uh, humbled by their collective intellect, and I am extremely proud to be in service of Dartmouth in partnership with them. Leading today's session uh, is Barbara Will. Uh, she is a Dartmouth gem. She is the embodiment of the teacher-scholar model that we speak to so often, the a and Newberry Professor of English and Associate Dean of the Humanities, uh, she is a winner of the Huntley Manley Award for Outstanding Teaching and an NEH grant among, recipient among many, many other honors. In her spare time, she was the chair of the Presidential Committee on Moving Dartmouth Forward. And um, she's just a shining example of the faculty that we are all so very, very proud uh, to have learned from. So please welcome Barbara Will. As I was getting ready for today, I heard the sounds of the alma mater drifting out from Rollins Chapel. I was sitting in my office in Wentworth and I could hear the sound of singing on a beautiful summer day in Hanover. And I thought, 
this place is magical, it's, the, it, it's eternal, it never changes. I really had that moment that many of you, I'm sure, have coming home to Dartmouth, that there's something es essential and eternal about the campus and about the traditions that we hold dear and mostly about the relationships that we forge. So saying that, I want to affirm the values and the venerable tradition of Dartmouth, but the focus of today's panel is on change and in particular upon the real disruptive pressures that are bearing down on higher education nowadays. Anybody who's read a newspaper knows what I'm talking about. The rise of online education, the pre-professionalization of students that call into question the liberal arts ideal, the increasing amount of student debt that students are incurring, the desire for parents and students to have a clear return on investment. And also, I think, in general, a sort of skepticism about the value of college. Why go to college? So these are pressures that we feel at Dartmouth. And I think one of the points of today's panel is to talk about change, recognizing at the same time as the March of Video March of Time video shows, and as, as Laurel Ritchie has just pointed out, that Dartmouth always has been a change agent. Dartmouth has always been a disruptor in a very positive way. Change is not the enemy at Dartmouth. It's something we embrace. It's something that our, our graduates and our alums hold dear as they go out as leaders into their fields, whether that's business, law, arts, engineering. So change is something that we grapple with as uh, pressure from outside, but also something that we want to cultivate and nurture in our students. So I ask you to join me today. I've invited six very uh, accomplished uh, leaders at Dartmouth to uh, join me at, at the table to discuss and wrestle with some of these um, issues around change. And I hope you enjoy eavesdropping on our conversation. I'm going to begin by inviting to the stage uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Elizabeth Smith. Um, Elizabeth. Welcome. Thank you. And I also wanted to just say about Elizabeth that she is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and you may not necessarily know exactly what that means, but it means a lot. She's um, in charge of 41 departments or programs on campus, and she uh, uh, takes care of 650 faculty members. So. <laughs> So, you know, before we get started with our conversation, when I look out into the audience, I recognize that probably about half of you um, did not attend Dartmouth, and I didn't attend Dartmouth either. And you know, when I first arrived here, and I started to interact with some of the alums, even the students, of course, who, who were just getting their feet under them, I thought, what is going on here? These people are so in love with this place. The, the loyalty, you know, the intensity of that love and that loyalty baffled me. I mean, I think I could have answered that question about whether Dartmouth is religion, like apparently so. Um, but you know, after 20 years um, of being here, I feel like, you know, that question that I had about, you know, what is it about this place that people are so, you know, loyal um, to, I feel like I have the answer and that is, you know, when you are, when you have the privilege, really, um, of being able to live and work in this incredibly beautiful environment, when you live and work with the amazing people um, that make up this institution and surrounding community, you feel that sense of connectedness to the place and to the people um, in, in this community. And so for those of you who didn't attend Dartmouth, by virtue of your being here today, you are part of that connectedness as well. And I just wanna say on behalf of all of us, um, we welcome all of you to this conversation today. 
Um, and the topics that we're gonna discuss are not Dartmouth specific topics. I think you'll find that they're relevant no matter to you, um, no matter where you live or what school you went to, so. Great, yeah. So Elizabeth, let's start um, with that big question that I, I posed to, um, to uh, our guests. Why go to college in this day and age? Or let me frame it a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Do you think college, or liberal arts college nowadays, mm -hmm. has the same value today that it always did? I think it has even more value. And let me start, and let me answer that by your, answering the first question about why go to college. Yeah. You know, I can think about what you gain in college as sort of falling into two categories, roughly. Um, some skills that we might refer to as the sort of hard skills, so that would be um, acquiring new technical skills or maybe gaining proficiency in a foreign language. Um, these are the real tangible skills, learning how to program, um, that you will likely need in your next job. Things that maybe you didn't quite acquire um, to proficiency in high school. The second set of skills have been termed the soft skills. It's not my favorite term. Um, but these are skills that really relate to things like um, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, being able to be part of a team, um, being able to really interact with the world. And I think that what a liberal arts education provides is really the combination of these two sets of skills, especially in a residential college mm -hmm. um, where you are interacting um, constantly with the members of the, your community inside the classroom, outside of the classroom, curricular, co-curricular activities. So I would say it's even more valuable today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some of that, the harder skills, maybe you can um, acquire some of them online. Mm -hmm. The soft skills, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds to me like you're also saying it's the combination of yes. the two. So you can have the hard skills without the soft skills and vice versa, but if you have both, that's a winning combination. It's an essential combination. It's an essential combination. I would argue that um, that kind of education prepares you not for your, ne your next job, but for your next four, five, six right. jobs over a lifetime because you are being prepared how to problem solve, how to think about challenges, also how to interact with other people yeah. to solve yeah. those problems. And, I mean, as we, now, as we know for sure, anybody who has college-age children or, or older, people are changing jobs a lot nowadays. Yes. So that, that we do need those skills to be transferable. We need to have yes. skills that are, make us more nimble to move into those next jobs. So, there's, so I agree with you that it's, it's the preparation for the job that you don't yet have that's, that we're really working on. Yeah, that you can't even imagine maybe right now. That you right can't now. imagine, yeah. So let me ask you um, another question about um, this idea of disruption. Hmm. So, uh, where, you know, what do you think about that when you think about um, sort of, uh, is, is disruption in higher education um, uh, necessarily a bad thing? Um, is it, it, are there ways in which, uh, you know, higher education needs to be disrupted, especially nowadays? And, um, and you know, where do you, how does the whole idea of sort of traditional values or um, the way we think about ourselves over mm -hmm. a long period of time fit into that question of disruption? And you can, you don't have to answer all of that, but just. <laughs> that's, that's good, I'm looking at the clock. Um, and? <laughs> let me think. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I can think of disruption on many different levels. Um, we've already uh, mentioned in, in earlier that the faculty are de facto disruptors. These yeah. are people who are at the cutting edge of their fields of scholarship. Um, you hear about them in the news that they've got a new way of thinking about something and so they are disrupting um, our old ways of thinking about a particular topic. So that's a kind of disruption that's related to scholarship and how we, we view the world around us. I can also think about ways in which disruption sort of come to Dartmouth mm -hmm. um, or about disruption within Dartmouth. You know, one, one great example is you were in charge of moving Dartmouth forward. That was an incredibly important activity that disrupted um, risky, unhealthy behavior on campus, and that was a really critical disruption. 
And so, you know, I feel like you don't disrupt for the sake of disruption. It's not like I'm a disruptor, that's my job. Um, it's, it's really about um, thinking very carefully about your core values and your principles. And when you have made a conscious decision to disrupt, it is because you are adhering to your core values. I think a great example is um, when Dartmouth made that conscious decision to go co-ed, they disrupted mm -hmm. um, you know, being an all-male um, educational institution because there was a core value and a principle about education for all. Another great example was the recommitment to educating Native Americans. Right. Really important example yes. of, of um, change. Yeah. Change from within that's, that's pushing the institution forward, but not necessarily changing the entire institution, just exactly. moving it forward in the way. And, exactly. And uh, I, I remember you had, you had mentioned this briefly, but the term disruption is interesting, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean, um, it, 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 what does it really mean? What does the term disruption mean? I'll yeah, ask you. you know, when I looked it up, um, <laughs> when we were, I was like, I need to you know, go back to first principles. Um, you know, and it's, it's really that um, you want something to s stop continuing to happen. Yes. It's a very strange definition if you yeah. look it up. Yeah. So that, again, suggests that, you know, we've made a conscious decision in dis maybe disrupting our own, mm -hmm. our own path for, into the future or, or taking change into the future. We've made a conscious decision that there are certain things that need to change. That's fine, but we go forward. Right. So, something yeah. we're going to discontinue. Yeah. Love talking to you as always. <laughs> I want to open this conversation out to some other people. So um, I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage uh, some other deans, and I will introduce them once they get up here, but come on up. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said dean. <laughs> Hello. Hi, friends. So, let me introduce our, our group today. Um, to the left of me is Dean Matt Slaughter. He's the Dean of the Tuck School of Business, and he was also, uh, for a time, a professor in the economics department at Dartmouth. Um, next to Elizabeth is Kathy Kirkland. She's a professor at the Geisel School of Medicine um, and also the head of palliative medicine at Geisel. Joe Helbley, our provost, is the chief academic and budget officer at Dartmouth. Um, next to Joe is Laura Ray, who's the dean of engineering at the Fayer School. And next to Laura, the inimitable John Cool, <laughs> <laughs> the dean of the Guarini School of Graduate and Advanced Studies. John, yes. thank you for coming. It's great, it's great to be here. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. I, I'm, I'm delighted and somewhat surprised to see so many people here at this time um, on, on Saturday morning. They knew you were going to be on stage. Yeah. yeah. And a yeah. Dartmouth alum as yeah. well. That's right. Um, so John, you, you have a long experience with Dartmouth, um, but I'm actually interested more in your, your sense of higher education right now and some of the issues facing us. So. Um, from your perspective, what, what are some of the challenges that we're facing in, in higher ed, and especially given your perspective as dean of the graduate school? Yeah, well, I mean, so one of the things that's been on my mind a lot, and, and we've talked about it before in this group, and you, you alluded to it a little bit just now, is specialization. And, and specifically, an interesting observation that, that specialization or the desire to specialize in the graduate student realm seems to be going in a completely different direction than a des the desire to specialize in the undergraduate realm. And, and what I mean is like in the, in the graduate realm, as dean of the graduate school, I oversee what, over 500 PhD students, over 300 master's students, and our, our thing is specialization. We come up with these CCs, we do a very deep dive into something. I mean, at the end of my PhD, I knew more about a motor protein than anyone else in the world, and, and, and 20 other people in the world cared about it. And, you know, but, <laughs> but, so, and, and, but today's graduate students are coming to me and they're saying they want more than just that deep dive, that they also want a broader experience and they want to be trained to do the careers that they want to move into, which these days is more often than not, not academia, 
So they, wanna, they want writing skills, they want speaking skills, they want to be trained in leadership, they want to be trained in, in group dynamics and how to set up a, a lab environment or a team. All these things that we were never trained to do when we were in graduate school. And, and also, they're looking at a much more interdisciplinary project. So they don't want to just be a biochemist or an astronomer or an organic chemist. They want to be an organic chemist who studies the biochemistry of Mars or something. You know? and so, so we're having to create more and more like these customized graduate programs for our students. They're going broader. And then they, are, they also want all these other skills. And this is also coming over to graduate admissions, where we're getting away from. At Dartmouth, we don't even require GREs anymore. Um, we, we look at GPAs, and if they supply GRE, sure, but, but we want to know what their life experiences have been, what their research experiences have been, what their community service has been, and what they're bringing to the graduate community as a whole. So we're going to much more holistic application review, and this is across graduate programs in, in the country. So then contrast that with some of the news coming out of the, the undergraduate, and I'm not even going to talk about undergraduate admissions. Um, and, and what's going on there. But, but let's just talk about you know, the, the challenges to the value of a liberal arts education that, that's in the national news. Is it still valuable? Talking about college as return on investment and what are the students gonna get for, for the large amount of money they're paying. And, and I think you know, that plays, is playing out at the national media across the country and it's also playing out here at Dartmouth. I mean, we're seeing more and more students switch from the traditional you know, liberal arts majors in the arts and humanities or even the basic sciences to majors, you know, computer science, engineering, neuroscience, you know, majors where they really feel they're going to be able to get out of Dartmouth and, and get a job. Right. And, and we're seeing nationally, I just read an article in Inside Higher Ed last week that, that you sent me, thank you, and, and it said, um, you know, it was about how many school colleges across the country are just doing away with whole departments so that they can take their limited resources and redeploy them in these areas that the students are really, you know, clamoring for in terms of, you know, return on investment. And, and okay, so, so you know, grads, grad school's going in one direction, undergrad seemingly is going in another direction. I don't really know what that means, and I'd love to hear what you all think about it. I mean, personally, I'll just throw out there that, that I think, you know, we, we need the graduate students to be a little bit broader, and, and it's not a horrible thing for the undergraduates to, to have some skills that will, you know, lead them but I, uh, the, the, in their future. But I would argue that we don't want to get too far away from it because we don't want our students to just be trained to do something. We want our students to be really thoughtful leaders, the out-of-the-box thinkers, people who can look at a problem, analyze it critically, and then make decisions that are really based on a broad perspective. So I, I would argue that for undergraduates, we don't want to go too far towards you know, this pre-professional track. So, so I guess my question to the panel, and I've got professional school deans here so they can argue with me. Um, you know, where do we want to fall on this sort of liberal arts uh, on one side, maybe to the pre-professional on the other side, or say specialized to general? So that's my question for the panel. So at first, as provost, can I ask you to send me that article that talks about doing <laughs> sure. away with departments? Yeah. Right. Not that I have any intention or inclination, but it would be really interesting to read and see how other institutions are addressing this. Now, I, I, I think there's a fundamental tension there, actually, particularly on the graduate side, when you think about the structure that the academies had in place forever, where we are asking and incentivizing faculty to educate and, in fact, train students really deeply, asking really narrow questions about the protein that you were studying or acid-base chemistry and not paying any attention to the broader educational elements that they could derive from a PhD education, particularly an institution like this, with the student's desire, right? Are, are we doing anything to address that? Is the academy doing anything to, to address that? I'm not sure that we are. Yeah, I mean, in, in the grad school, we're trying to. So, you know, the individual labs and the individual research advisors, you know, are, are, they can train people very deeply in what they're doing in their lab. And they can also be good role models in terms of this is how you mentor and this is how you manage a group. But, but what they don't have the bandwidth to really do is to, you know, this is how you give a good 
presentation. This is how, you know, writing support or entrepreneurism. So they don't have time for that. But what we can do is team up with Tuck or the, the, uh, the Magnuson Center and, or the Dharma Center for the Advancement of Learning to teach people how to do, create syllabi. So I think we're trying to facilitate that. I'm not sure that there's a tension per se. To me, it's a very dynamic system. And so um, I think the faculty are aware of that and they're constantly evaluating the curriculum to make sure that we've gotten the right combination of breadth and then depth. Um, and so I, I just see it more as a dynamic um, system. When you, when you first pose the difference between the graduate school and an undergraduate education, the word that came to my mind was sort of a convergence, you know, that, that in, 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 both, in both situations, you have to, you're converging on the right combination um, of breadth and depth, and the skills that you need um, are changing. Um, and so you, you, you start to get, you know, requests, and we respond. I, I actually think we do respond as we see those changes coming. Okay. I mean, I think some of the fallacy is that there is such thing as specialization that to narrow down makes sense in any situation. So to be a professional, you need to be able to think. You need to be able to interact across disciplines. All the things your PhD students are asking for are critical elements of living in the world. And I think the idea that the undergrads may just be mistaken about the idea that narrowing down is the right way to prepare to go out into the world. So to me, the Dartmouth education is there to say, no, you know, go across, go, go across all the schools and come out as a full human being and then you can do whatever you want. Let's pivot for a second um, to get some more voices in here. I'd like to hear Matt talk about if you wanna follow up on that or if there are other things that are on your mind about higher ed right now. Uh, thank you. I will, but let me, uh, if you ask me what's on my mind most about higher ed these days, I will say walls. Uh, especially in the world of MBA education, it's remarkable how um, uh, the world uh, and this force of globalization that in informs a lot of what John was just saying, but other things. Um, there was a period when a lot of the uh, alumni who are here, I think throughout campus, whether it's the undergraduate level or TUC or all parts of campus, there was a sense of Globalization is this force for good, and it remains a massive force for good in terms of raising average standards of living and uh, even for every country and for the world overall. Um, and yet we find ourselves today in a world where there's a lot of individuals that are seeking to build walls. Um, and the, it's interesting, uh, the definition of disruption that you gave, Elizabeth, um, what, what animates that in many parts of the world, the United States, you look at the UK with Brexit, but just dozens of countries, is a sense that um, um, societies have not been paying enough attention to the fact that globalization, good though it is in the aggregate and on average, doesn't benefit every single worker and firm and community. And so what people want to stop is those economic and social and life pressures that globalization has generated. Um, and for us, at, at all of us here at Dartmouth, it's remarkable. What we tend to do is tend to not to build walls, we tend to build bridges. And we tend to build uh, kind of ladders of opportunity to get up on those bridges. And so. I think the question for all of us that we're all thinking about is, definitely us at talk is, how do we um, empower individuals? We don't tend to use in the business academy the language of liberal arts, but our mission statement these days of educating wise leaders to better the world of business at talk, it's all about the aptitudes of liberal arts. So this tension of breadth and depth, we're constantly thinking about at talk. Um, we did the sweeping review of our curriculum last year, and talking to recruiters and alumni, the single most important talent, we, we put it on the question, What's the thing that you value most in people you hire, especially in, not just in that first job, but as you guys rightly said, the cycling across jobs, and how consistently across almost all industries we hear people say, ability to articulate and defend a point of view in an environment of disruptive ambiguity. That's the summary that our committee that we looked at says. Yeah, which is remarkable. So, uh, not that we, so the question I'm finding myself thinking about is, how do we try to empower our students all, in all parts of the school to think about how to be bridge builders, how to build those ladders of opportunity. We do it in our curricula with the great foreign study programs or Tuck Go, and there's different programs that we all have. Um, but how do we prepare our students to go out into this world where not everybody is thinking the same way about what globalization and these other forces mean uh, and how to get, to get them to think about, in some ways, this, they're gonna have a discipline base, but they're gonna have to be individuals that can have 
um, what Dartmouth is so great is with those, those liberal arts skills. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're really thinking, you're, you're really talking about sort of a, a, a set of competencies which we could use the term nim to be nimble in the way yeah. that you confront the world. I think that's a very interesting term that doesn't land on hard skills or soft skills, but it lands again on this idea that you can navigate a lot of different kinds of of in, um, situations, environments, pressures, yep. Yep. Um, and develop a point, uh, that point of view that you're talking about that allows you to navigate things. Yeah, that's totally right. One of the dialectics we talk about is we want you to be wise yet decisive at the same time. So wisdom is about asking the right questions, building the right teams, and taking the right risks. And we'll often say to students, or I will at least in different settings, look, for almost all of you, this is your last formal education you're going to have. There's a couple of Tuck grads on average that throughout in life they'll go to dental school or veterinary school or something different, which is great. Um, <laughs> But um, for almost all of them, we want them to understand, you're gonna have a next job, but we're teaching you a set of skills and aptitudes and capabilities that need to be with you for the next 50 years, not just the next kind of five months. Yeah, I love this idea, this disruptive ambiguity that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, because I know in my own experience teaching, sometimes when students come to college, it's the first time that there wasn't the right answer. Yeah, you know, they totally. made it all the way through high school, yep. and it's like, there's the right answer, and I, I, I tell you what it is, and I get a good grade, yep. and suddenly there's not a right answer, and that's really shocking. Yeah, yeah I think the, um, I would just add humility, sort of cultural humility, as you cross the bridge into someone else's world, you need to enter it with the ability to not just defend your own perspective, but to listen for other perspectives and be open to those. So I think that's also part of creating that wise Yeah, totally. The aptitudes of wisdom, to ask the right questions, you have to have confidence and humility. To build the right teams, you have to have empathy. And to take the right risk, you have to have judgment. So there's kind of trifectas that we talk about in terms of how to make it alive for a student. And even our MBA candidates, they too, as accomplished as they are, you know, they tend to be about 28 on average when they arrive at Tuck they're still often from an educational perspective of there is a right answer and a wrong answer. We're like, no, who's in the boardrooms and in the C-suite? Nobody's handing them PowerPoint decks with the right answers. They're having to discern it through the world. And this notion of bridges, I think, and you do this particularly well at Tuck Map, but bridges lead to diversity that leads to dynamic tension that ultimately leads to decisions that are harder to arrive at but much better decisions for the group. And I think about how that plays out. You know, Just a, a week ago, we were in here for a variety of commencement exercises, and in my remarks at, at one of them, and this happened to be the engineering school, but I looked out at the audience and I pointed out that the students who were graduating represented 27 different countries of the world, and in fact, the faculty represented 40 different countries of the world. And so this notion of what's an American university at its core, well, what we do extraordinarily well, you do this extraordinarily well at Tuck, I think we do this extraordinarily well at Dartmouth, is bring together this range of perspectives, put them in a classroom or a project group together, tell them it's not gonna be easy, but this is part of developing wisdom and becoming wise and thoughtful yeah. leaders. Thank you. Yeah. That's my plug for the Tuck tagline. No, <laughs> so and I, I, what I'm reflecting as you say that, we have, of the first and second students today, we have, um, the students carry collectively, uh, they come from 38 distinct countries in terms of the passports they carry. And about a third of our Tuck faculty are international, but you know, all of our schools are quite international. At Tuck, about a third of the students carry an international passport. So we're very global in terms of our student body. The companies expect that, they're very global firms. And yet, how are we gonna navigate in the time ahead? We, we aspire to be the disruptors of our graduates coming out and us faculty, as Elizabeth rightly said, but um, we're in an environment where what sovereign governments do and don't do, they, that may be changing, at least in the near term, how we're able to kind of bring the students together in our base camp, which is pretty amazing, and send them out into the world. So. so when we come back to what you said at the beginning and talk about walls versus barriers, does that change the way you think about Tuck going forward? Uh, it, it makes it more complex at the very least. So the Tuck Go, the suite of courses, Tuck Global Opportunities, uh, as great as the MBAs were in the past, now to earn an MBA you have to take at least one course that's experiential, rigorous, with faculty that's somewhere around the world. So we take teams around the world um, very much inspired by the foreign study programs for the undergraduates. Um, and yet, navigating that these days is, is trickier. Um, so. Let's hear from you, Joe, about uh, you know, disruptive issues out there in the world that you're concerned about. So, so, Barbara, one of the things I think about a lot 
as provost, but also as someone who, if you haven't gathered, was educated as an engineer, is this notion of technology as a major societal disruptor and something that disrupts higher education today in significant ways. You could argue that technology has always been a disruptor from things like the development of the electric power grid to e-commerce, air travel, penicillin even, I'll argue, was techno technologically disruptive for the past hundred years. Technology has played this incredible role. You look at the headlines today and they're different issues, but the themes are the same. We talk about drones, right? They're exciting. We can take videos. They might even be able to, is anyone from Amazon in the audience? They might even be able to deliver packages to your doorstep sometime soon. Or autonomous vehicles. We could reduce deaths nationally from 40,000 a year to 4,000 a year. Who doesn't love that idea? Or facial recognition technology, very much in front of us these days. So many positives. You can clear an airport customs simply by a scan of your face. Facebook allows you to go back and look at photos of you 10 years ago and today and tag the similarities, which, by the way, they're using for data collection. You can shop, you can shop in some places without an ID, without cash. You walk in, your face is scanned, they know who you are, it's linked to an account. I can walk out with a loaf of bread. How exciting is that? I tried that at the co-op. Yeah. <laughs> Ch yeah. Change. Thank you. Change sometimes comes slow yeah. in Hanover, New Hampshire. <laughs> right? Or even identifying missing persons or securing, securing buildings, securing hospitals, securing residence halls. Tremendously exciting, transformative. And we always think about the fact that if we don't do it, the, eco the global economic race is going to bypass us. But one of the things I think about a lot is not just how we do this, but whether we should be doing this. Whether we need to be asking the questions and teaching our students or having the conversations about should some of these transformations take place or should they take place before we develop adequate safeguards. I'll give you a quick example I read very recently, and this is a story that made barely a ripple in the news. There was a Western University that conducted an experiment funded by the Department of Defense where over a period of a year, they set up a long range camera and image collection system and scanned the faces of, it turned out, 1,700 distinct individuals walking across a college campus over a period of a year. And so they were collected in a database and they used that to improve their AI algorithms around facial recognition. The justification was this is perfectly fine because these are people in a public place. And five years later, and the story only came to light five years later, the images were posted on a public website so that people developing these algorithms could test their algorithms. And so I think that raises so many fundamental questions about privacy, about consent, about the direction that this kind of invasive surveillance is going without even pausing to ask a question, right? How many of you have an Alexa in your home, John? Right, right. I don't go to John's house because John has an Alexa. You haven't, <laughs> right, right. How, how, because I'm always saying privileged and confidential things. How many of you have an Alexa in your, like three people raising their hands this high? I know there are more of you than that, right? But think about the fundamental questions that that asks. It's not just video surveillance and how quickly and easily we have gone down that path. So I actually think for us, this is a moment of responsibility in teaching our students from the beginning that these are thoughtful and deliberate choices they're making and that has to be part of what we bring to them in their educational environment and that I think is fundamentally different than what we had to do 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want to jump in there because, I mean, one thing You is, have to defend the Alexa. No, no, the Alexa. <laughs> I, I like Alexa. But um, in terms of ethics, you know, one of the first things every graduate student gets here is a course in ethics and a session on ethics. And I think um, I, I completely agree that we're, we're progressing so fast that we aren't capable of a society to grasp the impl implications. And one thing you didn't mention that keeps me up at night a little bit is, you know, gene editing technology. And, you know, we, we have the ability pretty much to treat genetic diseases now in children before they're born. And that is a great thing, right? But 
but what we probably very soon will be able to tweak the intelligence gene up a little bit or tweak the eye color gene in the way that we want or might want or make someone a little bit taller. And you know, like we are, I don't think anywhere near ready for that kind of technology. So, you know, how, how, does, how does Dartmouth prepare our students for that kind of world? Because that's the world that's in front of them. Yeah, I'm surrounded here by at least three biologists or physician scientists. Haven't we created a very small scale artificial organisms? artificial organism. Um, by, and what I mean by that is putting small building blocks together to create something de novo. Um, de novo? What's de novo? <laughs> because, uh, you know, it was already here. Welcome to an academic <laughs> conversation. <laughs> right, What's right? de novo? What do you mean? I have a can opener. What do you mean by already here? <laughs> right, right. Well, my colleagues, uh, you know, my co because the, the, the building blocks were already here. Um, yeah. And so some of my colleagues would say we're accelerating evolution. Um, it would have happened naturally. Um, people have been doing genetics to create different organisms. Um, whatever it was, you wanted a cow that made more milk, you wanted corn that did this, that, or the other thing. So one would just say that the molecular biology is accelerating it, but that doesn't change the question, which is should we accelerate it? Um, and or I, when or, and when, right? When, it, when is that the right decision? Yeah. Um, when does it make sense when you're, if you're trying to feed the world, for example? Um, or if it's a medical condition and you can create something um, faster than letting evolution take its course, that would actually benefit a large number of people. But I would say in the undergraduate, I can speak to the undergraduate um, experience, which is I'm seeing more and more the faculty teach their courses that it isn't just content. It's not about how do you engineer a, a new organism mm -hmm. and, or create something. It's, they do incorporate these key questions, whether they're teaching um, policy um, in, in the government department or whether te they're teaching genetic engineering in the biology department. I feel like the faculty are really tuned into these questions and are um, not just teaching content, but also getting the students to think very deeply about these core questions. And of course, you know, um we have a, a brilliant uh, ethics institute on mm -hmm. campus that is grappling with these issues all the time. Um, and so there are places on campus where these topics are, are alive in a, very, in a very vital way. But I, I, I agree um, with Elizabeth that I think part of a liberal arts education, the reason a liberal arts education is so valuable is because it teaches you to be skeptical. I really do. And so, that is tied into ethics in my mind, that you are questioning what's in front of you and asking, is that the right thing? And that's a skeptical position that you only get if you have this broad education. And so when you, when you ask how are we preparing students, I think we're preparing them simply by educating them in a liberal arts vein, at least for undergraduates, graduate students maybe slightly Maybe we have to, in that direction. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. I'm so greatly encouraged by what you said, actually, about the PhD students in some ways driving us yeah. in that direction. At Tuck, we have an ethics and social responsibility requirement for each graduate, and one of the most popular courses is ethics in action. Anya Donovan's been, uh, been orchestrating it along with some other colleagues, but different faculty cycle in and they'll teach cases exactly like this. So um, one of the reasons one was on exactly this, uh, the human rights and kind of political issues relative to the business case of what artificial intelligence can do. So scanning technologies and so on and so forth. Other topics are what's a just top marginal income tax rate to um, you know, the ethics of global supply chains that might involve child labor. Right? So and again, we don't know the answers, but getting the students to really kind of grapple with it, and this is a great example where as a teacher, we learn at least as much from our students when these classes run well as, as, yes. as, as uh, th we give to them. And so many medical situations yeah. are context dependent. So there isn't, should we do it, should we not? But in this particular case, with these particular circumstances, does this make sense or not? And it's so individualized that, um, you know, you learn that by exposing yourself to the stories of the world and the people of the world, not through even an ethics institute. You know, this is every day. We need to be doing ethics on the fly, basically. I think it's a responsibility. So I want to pick up on your 
concerns about technology. Obviously, medicine is an exploding technology, and it, technology allows us to do so much to keep people alive, to extend life, to um, you know, do amazing things. But there's so many ethical issues that, to me, one of the biggest challenges is getting people to slow down enough to recognize, oh, this is a moral choice that we have to make here. Um, there's so much pressure to just get things done, to take actions, to make decisions, to move on to the next thing. And there's a saying, don't just uh, do something, stand there. So how do you teach <laughs> how do you teach students coming in thinking I got to I got to come up with the answer quickly and keep going and so I think about this a lot and I've turned to well the, my best preparation for being a doctor was my English major background in a liberal arts college <laughs> so I teach medical students to read poetry in order to get them to slow down. And I know that probably sounds crazy that the doctor in the group is teaching poetry, and I'm sure Barbara would do a better job than I, but <laughs> you do what you have here. to do. <laughs> and so I actually brought a poem with me today to our little dinner party. Um, and I wanna share it with you because I wanna show you kind of how this might work with, with students. So I'm just going to read you the first couple of stanzas of this poem by William Stafford called Traveling Through the Dark. And I want you to um, tell me whether you think this is nuts or, or not. So traveling through the dark, I found a deer dead on the edge of the Wilson River Road. It is usually best to roll them into the canyon. That road is narrow. To swerve might make more dead. By glow of the tail light, I stumbled back of the car and stood by the heap, a doe, a recent killing. She had stiffened already, almost cold. I dragged her off. She was large in the belly. My fingers touching her side brought me the reason. Her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still never to be born. Beside that mountain road, I hesitated. So I stop the students there, and I make them hesitate along with the narrator. In this moment of decision making, do I push the deer into the canyon, or do I try to save the fawn? And the students hate this. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what did he do? We need to read further, and I'm like, no, we, we have to stop, and I make them stop, and we grapple with these, this decision. Like, there is no right answer, they eventually realize, and they're, some of them sometimes will say, this is just like being in the ICU. And so holding them in this uncomfortable space with a decision for which there's no right and no wrong answer is something that I find I can teach through making them read poetry. So I'm not going to tell you what, what happened. <laughs> um, how does that feel? Um, but, but I want to say that I face situations like this every day in my work. It's not, this is not an abstract concept. I sit with families who have to make decisions where there is no outcome possible that they want. Do I take my five-year-old child off life support because his brain is so injured that he can't live the life that we planned for him? We can keep his body alive, but um, we can't get his brain back, not yet, anyway. And so these questions come up, and the ability to sit with the discomfort to help families navigate through these things is a skill that comes from training in the liberal arts, honestly. Uh, science tells us what's possible, but it's the humanities and the, the full spectrum of the liberal arts that enables us to do this kind of work. Um, I know you, you all have similar sort of moments of grappling in, in your work, and so I'm curious, do you think reading poetry is the answer, or? <laughs> 
I do, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm curious about what you what you want would say, John, because you've just talked about the breadth of the graduate experience. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess I would just say I think pausing is critical because if you don't pause, you never have time to reflect, and whenever you make a decision, and I think as as part of the senior leadership, I mean, we've, we've over the past few years become better at training ourselves to pause and reflect on what we're going to do. And because it's important, because you know, if you don't pause and then you do something and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I never thought, who would, get, who would have thought they would get upset about that, right? So, I mean, it's not quite as you know, life altering as your, your poem, but I think the, the whenever you make a decision in life or whenever you're doing anything deliberately, you wanna pause and reflect. And whether that's a graduate student saying, hey, what have I been doing over the past year when they're meeting with their advisory committee and you know, having that chance to sort of regroup and, and stop just day to day to day to day moving, I think that's a really important life skill. Yeah, I think it's more essential now. Actually, yeah. because um, what I've seen, I've been here now 21 years, is students' ability to pause has maybe gone down um, with social media, et cetera, et cetera. They're always on. Right. And so whether it's poetry or however you want to do it, um, I think it's essential. When we did this review of our curriculum, I mentioned um, one of the things the students said that they valued the most was exactly, and John, your word of reflection. That's the word that came up most. And on your insight, they, they in a world where they have access to literally infinite amounts of information at near zero cost, um, even our MBA candidates, again, having a lot of them do great liberal arts things as undergrads or sciences, whatever, how much they are still looking to be f formally taught how to process information and reflect. The gravity of what our students are addressing isn't as immediate, I think, as what that poem so eloquently describes, but it really resonates with um, when Yo-Yo Ma gave his talk last week up on the graduation stage, and he commented on the in, uh, imploring everyone to use power with the right values. Mm -hmm. A lot of business leaders, they're very powerful and they, they shape and determine how, how lives rise or fall in many ways, not as immediately perhaps, but our students value that so much. So we've, we've built into the curriculum now more structured time from orientation on where we now give them, we started giving them um, wisdom and insight journals, we call them, just to kind of symbolize, look, you're going to have to have time to process, but in addition to all the great things that happen in the curriculum and the co-curricular learning, we're building in now these blocks of time we'll be launching in a couple of months with the new class, where it's like, okay, now we're gonna have structured ways where different faculty and staff are gonna help you process what you're working on for your career journey and other things. I think one of the things I find most important is doing this in groups. Yeah, exactly. Where they can hear the person on the other side of the table has a completely different yeah. perspective, yeah. and they can argue, push the deer over, try to save the fawn, and as they grapple with that and they realize there's no right answer, they also realize there's no wrong answer. Right. And so that it creates this different ability profiles. to tolerate yeah. other people's perspectives, which is so critical in yeah. this world where everybody just wants to sort of be heard and not hear. Yeah. And, I, and I wonder in doing that, do you find that you actually need to teach them the mechanics of pause, right? I mean, ev everybody's mm -hmm. got these, right? And how often do we put these down? Right. Almost, almost never. And so do you have to teach them mechanically how to put your and devices away, take a journal out, write something longhand, or just go into a dark room, or we can do this in Hanover, a room with no cell phone coverage, <laughs> and say, <laughs> Have, a, have this kind of reflective conversation. So what I, I literally make them unfold only one line of the poem at a time, so that, that they have to stay focused on the first six words. And by doing that, it forces them to slow down, because as soon as you see the whole poem, you'll read to the bottom, yeah. and you never get to read it for the first time again. And so we, I think you're absolutely right, we have to teach them how to do these things that maybe we learned naturally growing up. Sorry to, this is such an interesting conversation, but I want to make sure we have a chance to hear from Laura about her, whatever's, whatever's on your mind about the challenges facing sure. higher ed. So, uh, you know, I have the fourth of my four children's going off the, uh, children going off to college this fall, and so what's been on my mind, of course, as, as well as, as many of you probably, 
is access and affordability. But um, what can I say about access and affordability that is new? Um, no, so it's been in the news a lot. How do you get through the door? How do you pay for it? But I asked my students this, and it was interesting that uh, there are other aspects of access especially that came through. And one is that it's not just about getting through the door, it's about getting to the door. And for some of our students at Dartmouth, um, that's, that's, a, that's an uphill battle, that's a, that's a challenge. And uh, one in particular that was a first year uh, student advisee of mine, um, he came from an under-resourced school in Chicago and he said, you know, it was all about having the mentors that um, pushed him to consider an education such as that at Dartmouth. But even when he came to campus through uh, various um, programs, he couldn't imagine himself here. He didn't have that confidence. And so one of the things I think, and he got through the door, and one of the things I think that's important about a liberal arts education is it gives students that confidence, that voice, that yes, I belong here. And in fact, um, not, not, not only do I belong here, but I bring a perspective that would be absent otherwise. So that was his story. And then I think even beyond that, once you're in the door, it's having access to what's behind the door. So um, we have our academic programs, but we have a number of these other programs that do build skills that, uh, for example, the, the Tuck Lab, that's a fairly new program, um, uh, some other Magnuson Center programs. Uh, in my case, this student participated in Thayer's first year research program, which led to a summer internship for him. The summer after his first year, he ended up as a teaching assistantship in a workshop that I had for faculty from other colleges and universities. And he saw the perspective that he brought to the table. And so he learned very quickly, it's a two-way street. It's not just what Dartmouth can offer me, but what I offer to this college. So um, I think that's an important perspective on access that we sometimes lose, lose sight of. But there's another uh, point here that um, relates more to engineering and in, in 2016, Dartmouth graduated more women in engineering science than, than men. This isn't a country that graduates. <laughs> so this isn't a country that graduates on average about 20% women in engineering. And uh, uh, as dean, a lot of people that I encounter say, well, how did you do this? And, Another piece of the liberal arts uh, education, I think, is we bring students in the door at Dartmouth, and even some of our Ivy League counterparts don't do this. We don't admit them into engineering. We admit them to the college, and they come here and they explore. Um, they learn, just like everyone else, to develop critical thinking skills. They take a language. They have an opportunity to study abroad, et cetera. They're not giving up any of that, and I think that's very important to women. And then we create a an environment in which they can bring those, those critical thinking skills to, to understanding a, a problem, technical challenge, um, as it relates to human need and, and pose solutions and develop those solutions. And we do that very early, and then they choose with their feet. They choose to major in engineering. And so we can reach students perhaps that weren't even thinking about uh, majoring in engineering when they get here. So that's how we achieve that, and I think I attribute that entirely to what Joe has once coined as liberal engineering, liberal arts and engineering as a um, combined endeavor. So, um, you know, so those are some of the things that I'm thinking of, but I'm also thinking of what could disrupt this. You know, it's really costly to do some of the things that we do. Uh, the Tuck Lab program, imagine, is incredibly expensive. That's underwritten by the Magnuson Center. Um, foreign study programs are very costly. I know, Elizabeth, we've chatted about that a little, little bit. But you know, we, we do want everyone who comes to campus to be able to access these programs no matter where they come from. So that's, that's what's been on my mind. I wonder what we all think about this. Yeah. It strikes me, I, I, you and I had talked about this very briefly, but there are also lots of uh, less uh, you know, uh, obvious things that might keep students from feeling like they fully belong here. For example, access to books or to mm. computers. Right. So there are things on that spectrum of, of access that I think we need to be aware of as, as leaders. That's right. I think some students are making very hard choices between buying a textbook or not, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. or um, 
going on a foreign study program or not, right. simply because they can't perhaps afford the uh, other expenses that, that might go along with this. The foreign study experience actually is a, a really great example of this and one that I didn't appreciate until a, a few months ago. There's, the, I mean, you all may not know this, there's a one and a half times difference in participation in foreign study programs between students who are on financial aid and students who are not. So the non-financial aid students are one and a half times less likely to study abroad. Part of it's financial access, right? But you know, we, we know how to address that piece, but it's all the other things you're mentioning. It's a much broader sort of cultural access. Many mm, of these students are students right. who have never left the country, and so to make the decision to study abroad is more than just knowing I have the resources available. It's providing mentorship and guidance so that they can make that choice with comfort. And if we want everyone at Dartmouth to get the full Dartmouth experience, that's something we've got to grapple with. Right. I mean, one of the things about the, the FISEP program, the first year student enrichment program, which we've been running for a number of years now, is it, it's for first generation students who come to Dartmouth and, and like Joe was saying, don't know the right questions to ask. You know, don't know that they can just go to office hours if, if they have a question or where, even where to get books and things like that. And I think that program's just been expanded very broadly. And, and I think that's really important because, I mean, when you, when you come to Dartmouth and you haven't been in a place like Dartmouth with the resources that Dartmouth has, you don't even know that these things exist necessarily. And, and I mean, Dartmouth's a place where you can really do whatever you want and hardly ever says no to, to undergraduates, but you've got to know to ask, so. Thank you so much for a, a really stimulating set of observations. Um, you might not be surprised to know that I've invited another guest <laughs> to join us <laughs> um, and bring something to the table. So please join me in welcoming President Phil Hanlon. Welcome everyone. Even the president gets a seat at the table once in a while. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. Uh, anyway, thank you all for these incredible thoughts. And as John mentioned, uh, the senior team has been more deliberate about pausing to reflect about the future. It's, it's kind of the most fun we have, I think. You know, what are the most important currents facing or shaping the external context uh, where's higher ed going? Where should Dartmouth position itself within higher ed? And uh, our vision is pretty clear in the five to 10 year time frame going out. But today I am gonna really go out on a limb and I'm going to paint a picture of higher ed and Dartmouth's place within it 50 years from now. In 2069, when we're all back here, some of you for your 55th reunion, some for your 95th reunions. <laughs> And uh, I give you a spoiler alert. Um, I am going to look at higher ed and predict a divergence. Uh, different paths taking, taken by the Ivy Plus group, uh, the sort of elite privates, versus the rest of higher education. And I know some of you work in higher education, and uh, I will emphasize, don't shoot the messenger. This is what I predict, not what I want. But uh, this is what I think is going to happen. Um, and let's do a thought experiment. Let's go back to 1969. Pretend we were here in 1969 and we were trying to figure out what would Dartmouth look like in 2019. And um, you know, if you had guessed about major change in the curriculum or the teaching methods or the degree requirements or the key extracurriculars, you would have been wrong. Those things are pretty much the same with some incremental improvements since uh, we were here in 1969. Um, there's been some major reshaping of the external environment and technology has been a big piece of that and you heard uh, Joe talk about that and Kathy and Elizabeth talk about social media and Matt talked about unlimited access to information. I want to talk about another piece of what technology has enabled that could be very important for higher education and uh, that is an assault on expertise. So uh, Michael Dimmock, who's the president of the Pew Research Foundation, spoke to the trustees about three years ago, I think. Uh, and his job was to tell us what would the incoming class be like 10 years from now. 
So he was supposed to paint a picture of the incoming class. And one of the things that he said which surprised us all is he said, we are in the midst of a shift on what constitutes an authoritative voice, from expertise to crowdsourcing. So uh, Kevin Kelly, who is the co-founder of Wired Magazine, said this way, he said that truth is no longer dictated by authorities, it's networked by peers. Um, Russ Muirhead, our own chair of the government department here at Dartmouth, together with a colleague from Harvard, Nancy Rosenblum, have written a book which is called A Lot of People Are Sane, that's the name of the book. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, they talk about conspiracism. So they talk about the old days, my generation, uh, many of your generations, when there were conspiracy theories. And what was important was the intellectual framework of the conspiracy theory. It needed to have explanatory value. It said who did it, why they did it, how they did it. Um, and in fact, the validation of the conspiracy theory came in part by how much intellectual heft it had, how well it held together. Um, today, they said, in this book, they say, um, we're in a new conspiracism where there is no intellectual framework. It's just absurd claims. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton is running a sex slave operation out of a pizza parlor. Um, <laughs> but the validation now comes from how many times it's repeated. So the, the, the theme here that repetition is replacing expertise to validate truth is a fundamental challenge to the Enlightenment ideals upon which the academy has been formed. Uh, runs contrary to the push for specialization you heard John talk about. Um, I find it a frightening prospect. Uh, it's enabled by technology. That's why it's happening now and didn't happen in the past. Um, I hope it's growing pains with technology and we will once again return to a valuing of expertise. It will swing back the other way. Um, but let, let's return to being here in 69 and trying to understand what Dartmouth would be like in 2019. And the big difference is who's sitting in our classrooms. That's the big difference from 69 to 2019. Uh, first of all, there's been growth. There are 40% more undergrads here than there were in 1969, and probably a commensurate growth in grad professional students. But as Laura mentioned, Laura Ray mentioned, diversity is a huge part of the change. We have women, that's great. Uh, we've recommitted to our Native American uh, support routes. Uh, students of color make up 40 some percent of our incoming class each year. Uh, first generation students, uh, something like 17 or 18%. Uh, of our incoming class, much greater socioeconomic diversity within our classes. And um, you know that is why one of the two north stars that guide Dartmouth right now, vision-wise, is uh, building a campus which is safe, equitable, diverse, and inclusive to sort of respond to this, this wonderful new reality that we have on campus. So this, the, the, the fact that the change at Dartmouth has been about access should not actually be surprising. So if you look at, over time at all of the revolutions in US higher education, save one, these revolutions have been about access and affordability. So the Morrill Act of 1862, which created the land grant universities and widely opened up access. The GI Bill, the uh, advent of the community college system in the, in the 1970s. Uh, the Pell Grants and the expansion of institution-based, need-based financial aid. These are all about access, and that's, that's what the big revolutions in higher ed have been about in the past. And so as I look out 50 years, um, I can't ignore that history, and I'm predicted that once again, the big revolution in higher ed is going to be about access. But unlike those prior cases I just mentioned, this time, it's gonna be fewer people accessing a four-year undergraduate degree or, gra or the current graduate degrees. Now, why do I say that? Why, why do I think there will be fewer people? So, first of all, um, there's some failures in the current system. So, if you look at students who enroll in nonprofit U.S. higher education institutions, only 55% of them complete a degree within six years. So 45% six years later have no degree. Um, beyond that, 
possibly related to, the, to that in this country, uh, we have built a system of higher education that we are no longer willing to support financially. So uh, states have disinvested systematically from public higher education since 2000. There's been a 34% decrease in per student funding uh, at the public research university since 2000. Um, and this is very striking from a public policy point of view. 80% of the undergraduate enrollments in, public, uh, in this country are in the public higher education system. Um, it, the public higher education system has been the number one engine for socioeconomic mobility in this country over, over the past 50 to 100 years. China is throwing vast sums into building a competitive arrival system of higher education. And so I think the disinvestment from public higher education is a public policy disaster in this country. And uh, one that, that, that really worries me as, as a leader, an educational leader. Um, but if you look beyond the public sector, in the liberal arts colleges, there's real storm, cl storm clouds. Um, those liberal arts colleges that do not have a robust endowment and are trying to run a residential program with tuition as their primary revenue source, the economics are horrible. And that's why you're beginning to see the first wave of closing of those institutions, which I think will accelerate. So, I mean, that, that's all to say, uh, it's not, not meant to be total bad news, although it sounds like total bad news. Uh, <laughs> it's meant to say that, that change is imminent. And uh, I think we will have an emperor has no closed moment, at which point we will be, uh, most of higher ed will be willing to move past the current structure into something new. Uh, you know, Barbara will ask some fundamental questions. You know, why does anyone get a bachelor's degree these days? Um, why four years? Whoever said four years was the magic amount of time. Um, so I think what we're going to see is, uh, for most of higher education, a move to uh, a more flexible degree type. So one reason that only 55% uh, of students complete in six years is because we have a tightly bundled undergraduate degree program. So either you get an undergraduate degree or you get nothing. Right? There's no three quarters of an undergraduate degree. So I think what you will see is much more flexible, fluid credentialing. Um, you will see uh, more emphasis on what Elizabeth was calling the hard skills, uh, greater career focus and pre-professional training, um, less residential, more online, uh, lower cost. So I think that's where the, the bulk of higher education is gonna be moving in the next 50 years. On the other hand, I got a much different picture for the sort of elite, elite slice of higher education. And I'll call, I'll use the term Ivy Plus group just for lack of a better term. So, you know, this is the, the Ivy League institutions, Stanford, Duke, MIT, Chicago, uh, Caltech, some of the, uh, maybe some of the uh, elite publics, the public Ivies, um, places like Amherst, um, Williams, uh, liberal arts colleges with large endowments. And, you know, if you think about our nation right now, we, we have severe inequities in income and wealth. And to my mind, they're actually just part of a, they're symptomatic of a broader phenomena. And that is the skyrocketing value that we are placing on what is judged to be the highest levels of human talent. So just a, a skyrocketing valuation of talent. And uh, artificial intelligence actually exacerbates this by placing a particular premium on what I'll call AI resistant skills. So skills where humans still have an advantage and probably will for the next 50 years. And these are a lot of the things that have been talked about around the table. Um, what Elizabeth was calling the soft skills, um, what John referred to, what Kathy referred to, um, extreme creativity, um, so really wacko creativity. Um, ability to synthesize complex streams of information, to sense patterns, and to uh, intuit connections between them. Uh, judgment, ability to make wise trade-offs between competing interests, and Matt talked about that and talks about that a lot. Um, emotional intelligence, reading, understanding others, active listening. Um, 
leadership, having the courage to make tough choices, to motivate others, uh, and so on. So, so those kinds of skills where humans still will have the advantage, um, I think that they will, they will be even more intensely valued in the future, and they hit the Ivy Plus group's sweet spot. So this is what the Ivy Plus group does and does really, really well. Um, we attract the world's most talented individuals. We have great programs to develop exactly these things, creativity, synthesis, judgment, intellectual intelligence, uh, leadership. It pervades our curriculum, our co-curricular activities, our extracurricular activities. Um, the residential model amplifies the benefit uh, that, we, that um, our community members gain from this. So, you know, one thing that's been consistent through the history of humankind is that when societies urbanize, there are big boosts in productivity. And there are big boosts in productivity that derive in part from agglomeration of talent. So when you bring talent together, when talent interacts, something magic happens, productivity goes way up. Um, and so my, my prediction uh, for the Ivy Plus group is that in the future, they're at, what they do right now is gonna be even more in demand. And there's gonna be even just intense access to what we have to offer. Um, a really good news part of this is that Dartmouth, even amongst the Ivy Plus group, has a strategic advantage in developing these kinds of talents. Uh, so we have the commitment to the liberal arts that Barbara and, and Elizabeth spoke about earlier. Um, the benefits from agglomeration of talent are most intense at Dartmouth amongst this Ivy Plus group. Part of it is our setting. We are a standalone community. We are here together. Um, we have close partnerships between faculty and students. That's one of our calling cards so that the, uh, the, you know, the collisions of talent are not just between students. They're not just between faculty. They're between faculty and students as well. Um, our intimate scale allows us to break down barriers and, and geographically uh, have people colliding with each other. And we have the world's most loyal alumni, all of you, <laughs> which, which means that the, the advantages of agglomerating talent are not just the talent on our campus, they're the talent of our alumni body coming back. Um, another advantage Dartmouth has, Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering why today we're not talking about climate change. Because climate change is the most existential disruptive threat facing our college, our alumni body, our community. And this college is still investing its multi-billion dollar endowment in the fossil fuel industry. And as we're seeing globally that the threats of climate change are hastening and worsening, and we need this institution of which we are proud alumni to take action. And you are yet to make a public statement since me, Annie Laurie, and other alumni began this campaign seven years ago. Dartmouth College is yet to make a public statement on this issue. So, so yeah, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I was. I was going to comment about our, our, our talented alumni coming back. And, and I was simply going to say thank you. And so I'm the new provost here, but I will say thank you. And I think on behalf of all of us, one of the things that I tremendously value is the determination of students to have their voice heard and make a difference. And so we're not going to promise you an answer on this question from the stage today, but we hear you and bringing these issues forward to the attention of the academic leadership, to the attention of the faculty and the community is essential. So. Okay. And an absolutely important part and a wonderful reminder of what I think is the value and empowerment that a liberal arts education brings to our students. Well, so I'd simply like to say thank you for raising this Give us a few minutes to conclude this conversation and we would welcome a conversation with you afterwards and offline. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I was talking about the pervasive, uh, the, the advantages Dartmouth has, even amongst the Ivy Plus group in, uh, in the future that I see and in developing these kinds of, uh, of talents that uh, are so valuable to the world. And another is the pervasive nature of our co-curricular and extracurriculars that support growth in these areas, so athletics, outdoor programs, arts, foreign study. And so, uh, you know, this is why you see the call to lead campaign really doubling down on these strategic advantages. Um, let me just sort of say what will happen to Dartmouth, I'm, you know, assuming I'm painting a picture where, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, experience we offer will remain uh, largely the same and will be even more in demand. But I think there will be some changes at Dartmouth, some, some evolutions. Um, there will be greater use of experiential learning, especially involving students more in knowledge creation. Uh, I think those, you know, the kinds of skills we were talking about that are so valuable, uh, creativity, uh, judgment, those are not things that you learn by having someone talk to you sitting in a chair and having someone talk to you, you have to actually learn by doing. Um, I think that you'll see admissions across the Ivy Plus group based more and more on the potential to develop those talents I mentioned. Um, I think that uh, the residential and co-curricular aspects of Dartmouth and the Ivy Plus group will remain vibrant and key to the development, uh, the talent development proposition. I do think you will see growth in enrollment uh, at, all across the Ivy Plus because if we do see the kind of divergence I'm talking about, then the, what the Ivy Plus group will have to offer will be in such intense demand that it will be impossible for us to be uh, anything but forthcoming with that experience to a broader set of people. And then lastly, I think to, uh, you heard Matt talk about this, uh, there will be an increasing global presence for the uh, for Dartmouth and other Ivy Plus groups. So, <clears throat> so to sort of wrap up my sort of 50 year prediction for higher ed, um, I do think that the Ivy Plus group will deliver the very finest liberal arts experience. Um, it'll be highly selective in attracting global talent. Uh, we will be focused on developing these kinds of high level intellectual skills it, the residential component will remain, and uh, sorry to say, I think it will remain very costly because uh, to deliver that kind of experience is extremely costly, but essential and valuable. And then meanwhile, I think that a large segment of higher ed in the next 50 years will move towards a more competency-based, less residential, more online, more pre-professional, uh, with sort of an unbundling of the credentialing, so more fluid, uh, flexible credentialing over the next um, sort of 50 years. So that's, uh, that's where my crystal ball gets a little hazy, and uh, I think I've, I've shared with you what I can. For joining us. It's been a wonderful conversation for all of us. Uh, thank you for our homegrown disruptive experience. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, there will be a follow-up uh, list of readings that we will um, be sending out in an alumni newsletter next week um, if you have any interest in following up on some of these ideas. Um, and we hope you take some of these ideas back to your, back to your communities and, and talk about them some more. Have a great rest of your reunion weekend.